Welcome to the Growler Lounge for our very first virtual class. Uh, it is April 13th, and you, hopefully you have a glass of wine in front of you. Uh, actually, you should have two glasses of wine in front of you. Uh, if you can, uh, make that happen. You should have uh, poured both yourselves uh, a glass of the Bordeaux, a glass of the Rioja, and uh, once we kind of settle in and I pour myself a glass, I actually have in-house IT today, thanks to the Harpers, to make sure... <laughs> to make sure that the signal stays uh, in place. Um, this is being recorded for some of you that asked for this to be recorded, and uh, hopefully that's okay with you. If it's not, I'm sorry. Uh, that's just how it is for this first time until I can figure out how to get a disclaimer going. Um, there is a live chat. If you haven't figured out where the live chat is, there is a more button at the bottom of your screen. It says chat. You can either do that within the screen or you can pop that out and have that as a separate window on your desktop. And if there's any questions, uh, just flag me down. I'm looking at live conversations as they happen, and I think everybody can see everybody's conversation. Uh, it seems like everybody's unmuted at this point, so if you have something to say, it should flag you uh, and then give you, the, give you the show. All right. <clears throat> okay. I heard myself in the distance here. It's echoing standby. But I'm glad to know that it's working. Okay, friends. So let's, uh, I, this is a, a different than a traditional class, mainly because we're going to jump around from two different regions, talk about two different wines. And so the, there's got to be some tie in that connects these two things together. Obviously, I wanted to highlight the 2005 vintage mainly because. Uh, both in Rioja and in Bordeaux, those were considered exceptional vintages, almost vintages of the century. Both of these wines, while very stylistically different, kind of showcase the quality of the vintage and how well lived they can be. Um, so I, f I figured that what we would do is actually talk about the wines first so you can start drinking if you haven't already, and then we will backtrack and talk about the regions. We'll talk about uh, both the, the growing areas of both places, we'll talk about history in both places and along with production. And then if you have any questions, we will answer your questions. Uh, again, if you have questions, just type and then hopefully I will catch them. And if I don't catch them, uh, hopefully you will unmute yourself and say something. Okay, so if you have both wines in two different glasses, um, if you haven't started drinking wines already, uh, and I'm going to be looking down because my wines, my camera is actually lower than, uh, or excuse me, my camera is actually higher than where my table is. So forgive me for not looking at the camera 100% of the time. Okay, so we'll start with the Bordeaux. We'll talk about Bordeaux first, but we'll also taste the Bordeaux wine first. I think it's the wine that's actually um, the one that's not going to live as long as the Rioja and the glass, mainly because of the fruit content and it doesn't nearly have as much acid quality to it. So pour yourself a glass of wine. Let's let's initially just look at them. Obviously, the Bordeaux has a much deeper content of or concentration of color. Um, and then right now, I have my Bordeaux in my right hand and my Rioja in my left hand. And it's very easy to tell them apart. Cabernet as a varietal is a very cherried wine. Uh, and Tempranillo as a varietal, while it does have kind of cherry flavors to some extent, the color of the wine is a lot more brown, brick red, garnet, kind of going into that brown spectrum than it is into that cherry red violet spectrum. So <clears throat> in terms of uh, what to expect when you drink a wine of age, particularly a wine that's more than 10 years, of old, 10 years uh, or older, is at some point, if you haven't noticed already, that the, the 2005 Bordeaux is already starting to throw sediment. Uh, uh, you see it at the bottom of the glass, you can see it. Um, hopefully as you poured wine. If you had trouble opening that cork, uh, my cork was very soft and spongy. Uh, I was able to get out in one pool, but m a lot of the times you will have issues with cork, and that's uh, one of two things. Either you have an older vintage wine you, or, uh, or you have uh, a shitty cork. And so you have to understand that if you're in terms of expectation, uh, how do I know what I'm drinking in terms of, uh, let's say, in, in the world of a blind tasting? Uh, if, the want, if the cork is spongy, soft, uh, you either have a cork problem or you have a vintage wine. After you remove that cork, if you have sediment, uh, more than likely you have a wine that is also a vintage. 
Uh, but that same thing, meaning if you have, if you know you're drinking a younger wine and you have a sediment, more than likely you have a problem or a wine that wasn't necessarily fined or filtered in its production. So there are some clues in terms of what you're looking at uh, that give you insight in terms of how that wine was produced and actually where it is in its lifespan. Okay, so I am looking at <clears throat> my Bordeaux wine. I've basically, I'm going to stand up for a minute so you can see what I'm doing. I poured, look, I'm looking at my wine like this. So I'm almost tipping the wine outside of the glass so I can look directly into it, all right? <clears throat> and ideally you have a white background so you can actually see through the wine. If you don't have a white background, you could use your palm of your hand, that works quite well as well. But in reality, what we're looking at is the shift in terms of very bright cherry colors into uh, kind of browner colors. And browner colors are a range of browns going from uh, what you would think of as actual brown, but there's shades in between that. You could think of them as terracotta colors. You could think of them as red brown, brick red, tile red, um, even into that kind of spectrum of amber uh, when it's really aged. But in reality, I would say that this wine is starting to turn a little bit brown. It's not brown by any means, but there is some, I would call it, bricking towards the front of the wine. Um, the other thing to pay attention to is really as you look at the wine, will it still kind of spread out like that is... <laughs> I just read Don's comment. <laughs> Uh, I, usually, I usually put two wines in one glass. <laughs> uh, hopefully, maybe at the same time, Don, is the question. Um, usually, when you're looking at your wine in this kind of position, um, th you'll notice that from the front of the wine, where the opening of the glass is, all the way to the part that's closest to your hand, there's a transition of color. Now, <clears throat> those transitions of color uh, indicate uh, a lot in terms of both uh, maturity of the wine, but also in terms of complexity of the wine. And really what we're looking for is, while we notice those transitions, we're also noticing that there's a color change. And so really what I'm seeing is a wine that is starting to show um, some maturity. It's starting to turn slightly off color, meaning it's not that true dark cherry color. And you can see that the transitions are starting to become uh, more smooth, even though they're very kind of upfront towards the glass. They are, they are showing uh, some tr smoothness between one transition and the next transition, okay? So let's, if you haven't already swirled and smelled, give your glass a smell um, and give it a swirl and a smell. Okay, so in terms of smelling older vintage, um, we, we all heard of the terms aroma and bouquet, but in reality, uh, those really mean specific things. When we talk about the word aroma, <coughs> aroma really means, <coughs> excuse me, aroma really means the, the smell of the fruit itself and the smell of the place. Any minerality, any earthy smells, any fruit smells, we will define as aroma. Bouquet would then be essentially everything else. Everything else includes both production technique and age, so the smell of oak, the smell of lactic, malolactic fermentation, the smell of lees, the smell of uh, a vintage, meaning as a wine ages, it becomes what is known as, it takes on tertiary character. It takes on a third realm of smells that is not necessarily oak smells or malolactic smells that mean production, but really uh, smells that take on things like mushrooms and, and um, hoisin sauce and kind of these umami characters, this kind of combination of both savory uh, and sweet characters is what we really pick up on the kind of tertiary smells. So as you smell and swirl, um, the idea is can I pinpoint both fruit character, non-fruit character, if there's any earthy smells, can I pick up production smells, which would be the oak, and then because we're drinking a 15-year-old wine, um, what else is there? What else is there that's lending itself to uh, these kind of leathery, savory, umami type of characters? So give it a smell. Constantly smell, constantly swirl. There is a situation at some point where this wine will essentially die in the glass, meaning it's of the age where it can't keep itself afloat. There's not enough structure there. It's past its prime. Um, 
it's it's too it's to be determined at this point whether this is one of those wines. The reason why I said that this wine is probably the wine you would like to drink completely tonight and then uh, save the Rioja for, or partially tomorrow, assuming you need to save some wines for tomorrow, is mainly because when we get to the Tempranillo, that Tempranillo is going to have uh, a lot more acid structure uh, than, than the Bordeaux. When we get to Bordeaux and we talk about the growing area and the conditions in which grapes grow and how wines are made, uh, we will talk about why some of these smells are actually uh, coming through in the glass, mainly because we talk about terroir as an end-all, be-all, but at the same time, we need to put it in context in terms of how the wine were produced, particularly in these places like Bordeaux, like Rioja, where production technique um, very much is at the forefront of how those wines are produced. They are very much stylistic, producer-driven wines, meaning they like to use a lot of oak, they like to age wines for a long time. That's not necessarily a fruit or a terroir type thing. That is very much a winemaker producer thing. So we gotta, <coughs> we gotta understand um, the difference between those two. So for me, what I'm smelling is this, let's talk about fruits. Uh, it's, a, it's a very black cherry component, uh, almost like a Luxardo cherry. It's alluvial, kind of like a old coffee ground component to me. Uh, and then the kind of this tertiary thing that's happening is uh, almost like damp, old ashtray, uh, wet tobacco, um, things that are a little bit more musty. And I think that that's part of uh, what it means to be an old wine, which is that wine sat in a bottle for more than 13 years. You know, this is a 2005 vintage, 2005 vintage, vintage. Most Bordeaux are produced within an 18-month cycle. Kind of your finer Bordeaux are produced in a 24-month cycle. So it, let's call it 13 years of sat in that bottle with very little exchange of oxygen, which means that a lot of that fruit character becomes somewhat muted, and we call that reductive. And so as this wine breathes and open, the question is, does it become more fruity or does it completely fall apart? Right now, it's, it's showing fruit, but it's also showing a lot of this kind of closed reductive character at the same time. Okay, so if you haven't tasted it, go ahead and taste it. Man, that's good. That's really good. Um, okay, let's, let's talk about this in some context. Like, why is this a good wine, first of all? Um, the question is, is it, one, it's still alive after 15 years. Keep in context that really 95 to 99% of all the wines in the world are not really meant to age more than five years. They are considered wines that you need to drink upon release. For a wine to live more than five years, much less more than 10 years, um, that still is showing character, balance, uh, liveliness, freshness is something special. The other thing is, is that <clears throat> when you taste this wine, there is a, um, a concentration of flavor that is only provided through uh, uh, really th this idea of a very long growing season or a varietal that takes up the full growing season. What, and what does that really mean? When we talk about Bordeaux and typically Western European wines, we talk about the growing season between April and October. These wines are typically, <coughs> excuse me, harvested in mid to early uh, or uh, early to mid October and Cabernet in particular is a late ripening varietal so it needs a full growing season to get the full flavor to get that weight that concentration of flavor that makes that wine feel like you are um, getting an experience that kind of just envelops the entire palate. Okay, the other thing to talk about is the tannin, or rather the astringency of the wine. We talk about tannins really as that, uh, that drying sensation, that astringent reaction that we give to the palate. Understand that we can get that same level of uh, astringency or reaction both from tannin from oak, we can get it from tannins from grapes, we can get it from acid, we can get it from alcohol. So let's focus on on the tannin. Typically when you drink a young Bordeaux, those wines are really just like super wound tight wines that um, need a lot of time for those tannins to lengthen. And essentially what happens 
with, tan with a tannin molecule over time is that as it ages in a bottle, meaning it is becoming oxidized slowly over time, those tannin molecules lengthen and therefore the wine becomes somewhat softer, meaning the tannins become less aggressive. So what's happening is we're experiencing a wine that has been exposed to oxygen, that the tannins are becoming softer, which means that they are becoming integrated with the rest of the wine. So then what's the rest of the wine? The rest of the wine is the fruit character, the acid character, the overall body of the wine. Um, and we can talk about those, but the idea is, is, is the wine complete? Meaning, is it, does, the, does the level of tannin match the body and the concentration of the fruit? I would say yes. Does the level of acid kind of stick out in any weird way? Not really. Does the alcohol, do you smell alcohol, do you taste alcohol? Not really. So the question is, is this wine still very much alive as a 15-year-old wine? And I would say yes. The question now is, uh, will it be alive in an hour from now or when this class is over or this evening when you want to drink the rest of the bottle, assuming you don't suck it all down like I will in the next half hour. <laughs> Okay, um, let's talk about finish briefly, and then we'll kind of move to the Rioja. We'll talk about the Rioja wine. Uh, we like we like the word finish. I think finish is a is a sign of, or a compliment to a wine. Most people look for a finish. They want to be able to taste that wine after they've swallowed that wine. The question is actually, how do you develop a finish? And understand that finish for young wines is a very uncommon thing, uh, mainly because the, the idea of a wine that has a finish is entirely a byproduct of that wine's evolution over time. Meaning, uh, this wine has a nice finish because it sat in a bottle for 15 years. And, and I'm going to put emphasis on bottle. Finish really implies a wine that has been in bottle for a long time. It has time to evolve over time in a bottle. And so this wine has a finish. Young wines that have a finish where you can still taste them, you got to question whether they are just intensely fruited or intensely flavored and therefore you continue to taste it. Or the reality is, is it doesn't actually, you can taste all the components, the acid, the structure, the body, the flavors, um, all the way through the end and then past after you swallow it. And that's the biggest question about a finish. So we really do define wine, quality wines as how well long do they finish? And that's, uh, you, you know, so at some point, you're going to get to a point in aging wines where you either you really appreciate the flavors of an old wine or you find them to not be what you like. And that's, um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a learning curve for, I think, a lot of wine people is that they, one, they often don't get a lot of access to older vintage wines. And then two, once they kind of start to taste a few of them, they realize that they like the the more intense fruited ones, the ones that are a little bit not as subtle as an older vintage wines, but some of them, when you hit them in the right spot, um, they can be quite enjoyable. Like I said before, 2005 was considered an exceptional vintage in Bordeaux. 2005, 2009, and particularly 2010 <coughs> are really considered the, 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 the three main vintages of the last really hundred years, if you will, that were exceptional vintages. And so I'm very happy to get able to get this wine. Uh, for this class, I actually bought all the wines. There were uh, 14 of them. So cheers to us for drinking the last vintage of this wine in the Texas market. Um, a little bit about the producer before we move on. Um, Chateau Verdinen is a producer that kind of claims itself as wines that are ready to drink early. That's their marketing strategy, if you will. And I think really what they're trying to say is wines that you're not making for your grandchildren, which is typically the Bordeaux philosophy with higher end chateau. Um, so what does that really mean to make a wine that is a drinker, uh, a wine that's ready to drink sooner? Really what we're talking about <coughs> are grapes that hang on the vine longer. We're looking for higher bricks. We're looking for um, uh, this idea of converting more sugar to alcohol, more sugar to alcohol to get a, a fuller wine, a more fruit forward wine, but also we mean particularly wines that have higher pH, so they tend to have less acid, meaning this wine is more juicy on the palate than it is acid driven, which will taste in the Rioja. Uh, and they, they are wines that typically have 
really less emphasis on production in terms of everything has to be like new oak. So when we taste this wine, actually, let me do this here. This is, I'm gonna pull up a thing on your screen. <clears throat> this is the tech sheet. <coughs> Excuse me, my coronavirus is acting up. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, so this is the tech sheet uh, for the Chateau Vernon and, and you can kind of see, um, I wish my cursor, I don't know if you can see my cursor. I don't think you can. Um, but really when we talk about aging, 12 months and, and um, one quarter used new oak is really what I'm looking at. Um, you can see the vine age, I'm not really concerned about that. But really this idea of how do you make a wine that's ready to drink when you're in Bordeaux when it's not this wound tight thing. Uh, we are talking about higher yield, we're talking about higher pH, we're talking about higher alcohol, meaning higher bricks. And we tend to use l things that provide less overall tannin to the wine so the wine is more enjoyable in its youth. So when we talk about tannins, oak tannins being one of them. And then also you can see the percentage of the, the, the breakup of the, excuse me, the breakup of the blend. We have 65% Cab Sauv, 30% Merlot, and then 5% uh, Cabernet Franc. And therefore, you know, when we talk about Merlot as a varietal, Merlot being a softer, more juicy, more fruity varietal definitely adds to that. Um, Chateau Verdinand, actually, in terms of where it's located, um, I'll get to in, in detail here in a minute, but it is on the left bank of Bordeaux, more cab dominant than anything else. Um, and so part of that terroir character, that minerality character that we should be getting from this wine is kind of those things that we had talked about where we have this gravelly coffee ground uh, kind of river bank rock character coming through, even though it's somewhat dark and hidden behind that uh, uh, kind of cherry fruit. I got to let somebody in from the waiting room. Stand by. <laughs> Lower. <laughs> it worked. The messages are coming through. Okay. All right. Yes. yes. <laughs> Um, you guys are doing so well. Here's a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you're doing really well or not. Hopefully you have a glass, at least a half a glass <laughs> in you at this point. Otherwise, I'm going to get really boring really quickly. Okay. Okay, so let's go to, let's go to the Rioja wine. We're going to come, you know, the whole idea is to get the wines out of the way so we can talk about the places. So don't feel like you have to consume everything right now. We're going to talk about Bordeaux. We're going to talk about France a, a little bit. But I wanted to get the wines out of the way so uh, you don't have, feel like you have to wait to drink them. Not that they would. Okay, <clears throat> so um, let's talk about Rioja, Grand Reserva Rioja. Uh, let's talk about Tempranillo briefly. And I'm going to pull up another <laughs> image here. Hopefully that will work. There we go. Um, this is basically about Tempranillo. <clears throat> and um, one of the things that we get <laughs> with Tempranillo is a, a, a much drier style of wine, first and foremost. We tend to get very similar body to Cabernet. But really what we're looking at is this idea of very firm tannins, high acid type of wine that has a, a very love affair with oak. It likes oak, it likes to be an oak, not only in the short term, but also for a very extended period of time. And the, and the reason why it has the ability to stand up to that much oak um, is mainly because of its acid structure. Uh, acid being the number one preservative of wines, it needs it for both microbial protection, but it also needs it for freshness. And so the more acid you have in a wine, in reality, the longer that wine can live, as long as it has other things to kind of go on that it can lean on, like color, like tannin, uh, like alcohol and, and body and things like that. So we, in being in Texas, we're all very familiar with Tempranillo. Uh, Tempranillo, <coughs> Tempranillo is one of these varietals that um, is, is, is confusing depending on where you are in the world, mainly because it has over 41 different synonyms uh, that it can go by. Every region in Spain has its own unique word for the word Tempranillo. We, of course, know it as Tempranillo, which literally means 
the, the temperate one. Um, and what that really means is that it is both um, medium in terms of ripening, uh, in terms of bud break, medium in terms of when it actually is ready to harvest. Uh, it, it is temperate and it is not a varietal that um, is very vigorous, but it has these, as you can see in the picture, these huge, these huge clusters. So part of producing a, a quality Tempranillo, obviously yield plays in the part in every type of production, but with Tempranillo, you need to make sure that within a given vine that your cluster, because they are so big, that there's enough airflow to allow the inside of that cluster to not become uh, succumb to both mold and mildew, but also that those inner berries can, can become ripe. So it's very important that on a given vine that a Tempranillo cluster has enough uh, of its own space and enough of its own concentration uh, to become fully ripe, to become a, a quality wine. Okay, so let me see if I can reduce this a little bit. Maybe. No, okay, I'm just going to delete it. Okay, so give it a, if you haven't smelled it and looked at it, give it a smell, give it a look. Obviously, the color of this wine is much more brick red, tile red than the cherry Cabernet. Um, I, uh, just to kind of be transparent here, you guys are drinking a 2005 Gran Reserva <coughs> Tempranillo from Rioja. I am drinking a 2007 Gran Reserva. Um, I ended up, uh, the order that I had placed for these wines, they did not. Uh, send me all the bottles because they ran out. So they sent me what they could. Um, everybody in the class got the right wine. I'm actually drinking an older vintage wine. Um, but nonetheless, it's still Tempranillo and uh, it'll give us the same kind of context. Okay, so give it a swirl, give it a smell. <clears throat> I'm gonna pull up the text sheet as we talk about this wine. Here's your tech sheet for this wine. Sorry if it's fine print. I don't know if you can even read that. But in reality, what we're talking about is just like Bordeaux, Rioja is a blend. It is common to get 100% Tempranillo, but traditionally, when we talk about traditional winemaking, and this is gonna kind of feed into the lecture part of this, when we talk about traditional winemaking in Rioja, it is always a blend. And it can be a blend of mostly Tempranillo, which by law has to be, a, depending on where you are and what region, in Rioja it's a minimum of 65% <coughs> Tempranillo. Um, it also is a blend of Graciano, another red varietal, uh, and then also Mazuelo, which is Carignan. Um, and there is also a fourth varietal that can be in the traditional Rioja blend, which is, which is Garnacha. Garnacha, which it becomes more famous kind of in the uh, Catalonia region, further east towards Barcelona and, and south of Rioja. Uh, but technically there are four grapes. There's another minor grape, which we really don't see. Uh, but really four grapes that can be technically in a Rioja blend. Now producers have the opportunity to, um, to, to kind of within a range of percentages choose how they build their wines. Uh, this particular wine that you're drinking is 70% Tempranillo, 20% Graciano, and 10% Mazuelo. And <clears throat> you can see the aging, uh, aging in um, second year medium toasted American oak from Ohio and French oak for a minimum of 30 months, and then six months um, in a basically tank, and then another 36 months in bottle. And so we're gonna talk about aging rules when we get to the region here in a second, but I wanted to get you an idea of how much production went into this wine uh, in terms of not before you even got it. So uh, when we talk about this is basically where we're at. We're at 66, 72 months, 70, yeah, 72 months, um, which is six years, six years of, of production just to produce a wine that eventually hit the market. So you're drinking in 2005. This wine got released into the market in the fall of 2011, um, which is, which is an odd, an odd thing to consider. So I expect 
um, more character of oak, more character of oxidation because of that time in oak. But the question is, is how savory does it, is it going to be? Is it still alive? Is there freshness? So if you haven't smelled it already, give it a smell, give it a taste. Yeah, the, the Donna is saying caramel, Cynthia is saying caramel. Yeah, it really kind of a sweet core to this wine. And, and that's a byproduct of both uh, that's American oak. When we talk about American oak versus French oak, American oak, when it's very youthful and then young wine, gives you this intense character of both uh, that, that kind of true oaky smell, what you imagine oak to smell like. It also gives you this character of something herbal. We put the word dill behind there because most people know what dill smells like, fresh dill in particularly. And then it also gives you this kind of vanilla, vanilla and coconut character. And then as that wine ages, that, that oak character also oxidizes. And you start to turn into a lot more um, caramels and butterscotch and molasses uh, uh, character, maple syrup and on, some, on some levels that the fruit character is there enough to, make, to lift that out of the wine. The other thing that a lot of people get out of Tempranillo is, is a little bit of a, of a spice or a pepper component. Um, there's, a, there's a green herbal component that is a little bit more rooted in terms of both root vegetables or even stimmy character. Um, I kind of, and Wes, I'm kind of thinking about um, like a cigar when you, after you put out a cigar and you come back and smell, it's got a little bit of that earthy dried herb, dried leaf character to it that can tend to lend itself to be a slightly more spicy than, than sweet. All right. Okay, so if you feel like commenting, please do green bean, veg vegetal on the palate. Yeah, and the acid is high. Does everyone notice the high acid? Um, it's also got very well <coughs> integrated tannin on it. Um, the, the, the acid level is so high that it, like you constantly have to swallow to keep their saliva down from kind of overtaking your palate. Um, the wine in terms of concentration of fruit, meaning kind of that hyper focus, the weight of the wine on your palate, the concentration of fruit, the overall body of the wine, isn't necessarily on par with the Bordeaux. Technically, we should be drinking this wine before the Bordeaux. But in terms of lecture and um, uh, the theory that we're going to talk about, I wanted to talk about Bordeaux first and then come back and do Rioja uh, for many reasons, as we'll discuss. All right, any questions before we jump into uh, talking about these growing areas? So far, no technical difficulties, thanks to my in-house IT team. And I told myself, if we get through this without any issues, I'm drinking another bottle of wine. You should also drink a third bottle of wine, just because it's, it's Monday. Cheers to Monday. Hope everyone's surviving Corona, Corona 2020. Next year, we'll have Modelo 2021. Okay, let me get rid of this text sheet. Okay. So we're going to talk about France, and then we'll specifically talk about Bordeaux. It was interesting trying to figure out how to, you know, doing a virtual class is not like doing a, a normal seminar or a lecture. Um, and I don't know why, but it feels different, mainly because of the technology, I think. But um, there's no reaction from the audience, from the students, to really know if I'm um, talking over your head or not, or if I'm not providing enough information. So please let me know if this is too elementary, I can go in deeper detail, or if I need to um, uh, back it up a bit and, and, and simplify things a little bit more. Okay, hopefully this map is big enough for you. I don't know. 
I'll try to make it. That's as big as I can get it. Okay, this is a map. I took it from Wine Folly just because they have great maps. <clears throat> um, so let's. When you look at the 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 country of France, obviously. Um, it's not as big as the United States. Uh, it is one of the larger European wine regions. And it is a region that's really divided into 14 different growing areas. And within those 14 different growing areas are what we we'll call Appalachians. And uh, let me back up. I guess what I'm trying to get to is the nomenclature for how we'll use terms, the proper words in which to talk about a place. So in France, there are 14 growing areas. We'll call them regions. Within a region, there is an appellation, which we're going to talk about the Bordeaux appellation. And then within the appellation of Bordeaux, there are what is known as communes. And then within a commune, there is known as what is a village. And then within the village, there are vineyards. Okay. So as we kind of move up in terms of detail of a place, that's the hierarchy. We go from region, we go to appellation, commune, village, vineyard. Um, and really when we start talking about Burgundy, which we'll talk about Burgundy on April 20th with the Chardonnay class, <clears throat> that idea of hierarchy becomes very, very important because in Burgundy, the idea that you can have a single vineyard growing area that's recognized as this independent growing area from everything else is very much a thing. We really don't see that in Bordeaux, but in Burgundy, it's very much a thing. So, <coughs> excuse me, um, the, the map of France here is 14 growing areas. If you look, I'm going to start kind of in the top left and work our way around. It kind of makes a horseshoe shape starting in the top left, the northwest. We have the Loire Valley. The Loire Valley is the largest grape growing region in France in terms of um, land area. It's basically a 900 mile long growing region that basically sits on both the north and south banks of the Loire River. Um, then we have, underneath that, we have Bordeaux. Bordeaux being um, really two things. It is not the most productive region, but in terms of land under vine, it's the concentration of vines in a single place. It's the number one vine concentrated place in France. And two, it is the wealthiest region in all of France based off of how much wine is actually produced and the number of producers that there are. Um, in Bordeaux today, there's over 7,500 different producers and over 10,000 different growers. So there's a lot of concentration of production in a single place, making Bordeaux kind of the most densely planted place um, in France, even though it's not the most productive place in France. Um, within Bordeaux, we have several, uh, another growing region called Cognac. Cognac is a, a brandy producing region, but it uses grapes to produce brandy. Grape, bra uh, excuse me, brandy is a grape spirit, not a grain spirit. Um, so just south of Bordeaux, we kind of have this smattering of, of what we will call Southwest France. And Southwest France is really kind of all over the place. And it also borders Spain on the Pyrenees border, uh, that mountain range there. But in the middle of southwest France is another growing region, which I don't think is actually shown here, uh, called Armagnac, which is the second brandy region. As we go kind of southeast of southwest France, we have the Languedoc Roussillon. The Languedoc Roussillon historically is the most productive wine growing region in France, uh, mainly because they are a warmer climate. And when you get to warmer climates, you have the ability to produce more things. It's also close in proximity to two major ports, both the ports of uh, Cassis and the, and the ports of Marseille as we kind of go into the Provence area. So being on the easy access to the Mediterranean, when we talk about all the civilizations that have ruled the Mediterranean, primarily the, the Phoenicians and the Romans uh, and the Greeks, these are all places that each one of these cultural uh, civilizations have, have been to. And therefore, any place that's on a coast, particularly the Mediterranean coast, is a highly productive growing area. Um, as we kind of move past the Languedoc Roussillon, we have uh, Provence. Provence, obviously, very famous for rose. Um, it is also where Marseille is, a very beautiful port town. Um, and then just north of Provence, we have the Rhone Valley. Again, the Rhone Valley is um, a place that's near and dear to Texas because we are producing a lot of those varietals. 
And what's interesting is a lot of the varietals that have, are being produced in the Rhone Valley actually originate in Spain. When we talk about Carignan and Garnacha uh, or Garnache in, in France, uh, Syrah, uh, these are all varietals that originate in Spain and make their way into the Rhone Valley uh, over time. Okay, north of the Rhone Valley, we have a map on page 189 of the book. What book, Don? Oh, oh, the Wine Folly book. Yes, that's a really good book. Um, the Rhone Valley, uh, just north of the Rhone Valley, we have Beaujolais and Burgundy, uh, Gamay and Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, uh, which we'll talk about Chardonnay on, again, on 420. Um, to the east, that hugs basically the, the French and Italian, uh, the French and Italian Alps is basically, um, not the Italian Alps, the Swiss Alps, is uh, the, the regions of Savoy. We also have the regions of Jura, these kind of very Alpine styled wines. Um, and then we have more famous regions as we continue going further north. We have Champagne, of course, and then Alsace. Uh, and those are your, your kind of 14 main growing areas of, of France. So we are really gonna talk about Bordeaux. And let me get rid of this map and pull up another map. All right. So when we talk about Bordeaux, um, I wanted to talk about Bordeaux first because it technically is, oh, did you hear that sound? I love that sound. I don't know if you heard that sound, but that means more people are taking classes. <laughs> uh, which I appreciate very much. Um, uh, I want to talk about Bordeaux first, not not because it's the oldest region. Actually, Spain uh, is much older. Uh, Spain really goes back to 1100 BC. Um, Bordeaux uh, really became a region in the early 4th century by the Romans. Um, I wanted to talk about Bordeaux because it sets a lot of precedent for how Europe in general does a lot of things, but one of the, the, the big historical things that we'll talk about when we get to Rioja is a direct byproduct of Bordeaux. Um, and I, there's a many stories within a region. I, I'm gonna talk about uh, one or two stories uh, for each region. <coughs> that way we have some context and some glue to work off of. And then, um, and then we'll kind of move on. But let's talk about the, the map here for a moment. Um, so Bordeaux is a, is a growing area that basically is an estuary that sits on the Atlantic Ocean. It is a region that for, for most of its early history was not a growing area. It was essentially a, a trading post. It was a mall. It, it, was, a, it was a place for commerce. And so um, you had a lot of <coughs> craftsmen, artisans, uh, people that would come to Bordeaux in terms of its, its city and they would trade goods and services. And uh, over time, what we end up having uh, is a situation where the Dutch would come in into the mid and late 1600s and start to drain um, a lot of the water in terms of the swampy areas that were developed in this estuary that allowed it to become kind of this pristine growing area that it is today. So when you look at the map, <coughs> you can see the there's, a, there's a Atlantic, you can see the beginning of the Atlantic Ocean on the left side, and then you have one very, very large river that then divides itself into two tributaries. The very large river is called the Garonne River, and then you have two tributaries that are formed, one called the Dordogne, and the other one called the Gironde. And those two tributaries basically carve out another region called the Entre des Mer, which uh, is that light green region in the center of the page, which literally translates into between two seas. Um, but when we look at the map of Bordeaux, we have this very large river, the Garonne, that basically cuts the region in half. Um, and we talk about Bordeaux in terms of two halves, the left half, the right half. We really talk about them in terms of left bank and right bank. The left bank um, forever and always is the home of Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, and while Bordeaux wines are traditionally blends, it's very rare today that you will get a Bordeaux wine that is not a blend, but that blend is always based off and informed by 
uh, Cabernet Sauvignon. So Cabernet Sauvignon is the is the star. And as uh, you may or may not have heard, kind of the love affair that Cabernet Franc had with Sauvignon Blanc, they basically uh, created Cabernet Sauvignon. So when we talk about the home of varietal, that home for Cabernet Sauvignon is the left bank. And we're going to talk about more of the left bank than we do the right bank, but the right bank is the home of Merlot. Okay. So in terms of climate, <clears throat> what ends up happening is um, the left bank, the left bank, <laughs> excuse me, <clears throat> the left bank is considered to have what is known as a maritime climate. A maritime climate is a growing area that is mitigated by bodies of water, in this case both the Atlantic Ocean and the Gaudron River, and therefore you have very temperate climate in both the summer and winter. Your winters don't get that cold, your summers do not get that hot, but the issue that you do have um, is, is humidity um, and rain, particularly rain in the growing season. So when we talk about the two main threats that Bordeaux faces, it is both uh, rain in the growing season, and when we talk about rain, it's not just wet, it's not just water. Uh, with rain comes thunderstorms. With thunderstorm comes hail. So rain and rain with thunderstorms, which means rain plus hail, are major issues in a growing season. Uh, hail is probably uh, the worst. You can always deal with a, a rainy growing season. Um, through blending and through other kind of sagne methods or bleeding off methods in the winery. But if something comes along and hails you out, you, you, your fruit gets destroyed, your leaves get destroyed, your entire canopy, canopy can be destroyed. So rain and hail are the two biggest issues. And then humidity. Humidity is, uh, we, whether we have this term in the wine industry that growers use called, um, um, the term just slip, disease pressure. So when we talk about disease pressure, really what we're talking about is mold and mildew. And it is, it is in Bordeaux where not only do we get the world's most famous wine sauternes because of this humidity that produces mold and mildew, but it is also because of Bordeaux where we figured out how the rest of the world should deal with disease pressure. Like how do you deal with fungus and molds and mildews that are growing in your vineyard when you don't want it to produce a dessert wine, um, mainly because you don't produce dessert wines. So uh, these are things that have affected the rest of the world, which we'll talk about um, uh, here shortly. So <clears throat> Bordeaux, again, uh, on the left bank, first and foremost, Cabernet Sauvignon is the, is the king. It's the star. It's the grape that we pay the most attention to. The growing area, um, and you can kind of see these colors here, this legend, but the outline of basically Bordeaux is basically the entire left bank and the right bank, the, everything that surrounds uh, the, the boundary of this image that we're seeing on our screen. And then everything, if we were to produce a wine just from the left bank, that would be the next image down, which would be called the Medoc. And the Medoc is the, the boundary of the darker purple image, both from um, the northwest on the north side of, of the image uh, all the way down to the south where it kind of hits that yellow uh, kind of off-white uh, or excuse me off-yellow color at the bottom of the image. So the Medoc is basically the, the, the word that we use for left bank. Simple. Now with, within the left bank or within the Medoc we have sub-appellations um, and sub-communes, and really, when we talk about the most famous wines, they are coming from what is known as the Ot Medoc, the Upper Medoc. And the Ot Medoc is basically, um, let's see, you can see, hopefully you can see it, there is a very yellow, uh, small yellow region. Yes, that is the Ot Medoc, H-A-U-T Medoc. There is a small yellow region, and then the center has the black dot that says the, the city of Bordeaux. <clears throat> and you can see the light purple just north of that. And there's a little bit more of that same light purple kind of further north of that. That is considered the Haute Medoc. So the Haute Medoc is basically the, um, the, upper, the upper Medoc uh, and everything beneath uh, Bordeaux would be considered the, the Bas Medoc. 
and that would be considered a different region, which we'll talk about here in a second. So the wine that you're drinking is from the Haute Medoc. It is a wine that is actually from the commune of Pouillac. Pouillac is another one of your colors here on this page. But it is a wine that, while the winery is located there, they are sourcing grapes from within the Haute Medoc. Okay. Okay. So the region th that's south of um, Bordeaux, the the center yellow dot on the left side, that is known as the Greater Graves. Graves literally translates into the word gravel, and <coughs> this is where your very famous white Bordeaux come from. And then further south on that side, you can see the, 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 the most famous dessert wine growing areas are the regions of Sauternes and Barsac. And those are kind of located at the very bottom um, in terms of that, that true brown, that true yellow at the very bottom uh, of the image uh, within that larger purple area. So that, this is what constitutes the left bank. Uh, in the Haute Medoc, you have the world-famous red wines. In the Bas Medoc, you have the world-famous white wines plus dessert. Now, <clears throat> when we talk about white wines, we really talk about Sauvignon Blanc and Simeon, uh, both for dry and sweet wines. And when we talk about the very famous red wines or red wine in general, Cabernet Sauvignon is the most important, along with the four primary blending grapes, which are uh, Merlot, first and foremost, Cabernet Franc, Petit Verdot, and Carmenere. Uh, Malbec historically is one of these varietals also, but uh, Malbec uh, really takes a major exit after the end of Phylloxera, mainly because it is a very difficult varietal to graft to, uh, and so it made an exodus from Bordeaux and ended up finding its way into Argentina, which is where it kind of thrives today. <clears throat> okay, so on the right bank, right bank is... Um, mostly Merlot and Cab Franc. Very little Cab Sauve is planted in the right bank. And your most important growing areas are growing areas by the name of Saint-Emilion, Saint-Emilion Grand Cru, and Pomerol. Those are your three big growing areas. <clears throat> but there's, a very, there's a, quite a few other smaller communes that are also quite well known that are more value driven. Uh, even St. Emilion Grand Cru, you can find those wines at really affordable prices that are quite delicious. The right bank is always going to be um, more affordable, more value driven than the left bank, mainly because the land lends itself to more production, uh, but also Merlot. You know, people tend to judge Merlot, unfortunately so. Um, there is one exception, which is uh, there is a winery in Pomerol called Chateau Petrus. And Chateau Petrus is uh, literally the world's most expensive wine. And it is Merlot and um, Cabernet Franc. Uh, I'm sure we've all seen the movie Sideways. And the very last scene in the movie Sideways, he's drinking his, his most precious wine from the 1969 vintage of Chateau Cheval Blanc. Chateau of the White Knight is literally the translation. Wow. Chateau Cheval Blanc is a right bank Bordeaux. It is a Merlot and Cab Franc based wine. So they, sent the, they spent the whole movie bashing Merlot and then in the very end he drinks his favorite wine which is Merlot. So there's a, a, back, a backward compliment that no one really got and unfortunately it destroyed the entire market for Merlot. Yeah. Although, although um, what's exciting about Merlot today is I think they got the message <laughs> And now they're making very serious styled Merlots that aren't just grape juice for adults. And so if you haven't had Merlot recently, you should definitely give it another try. From whatever country or from whatever region, I'm a big fan of Washington Merlots. They seem to be uh, a really high quality, really great value. Uh, and they're just easy drinking, you know, kind of pajama, pajama wine. Okay, and then the other third larger region um, that looking at this map is the Entre de Mers, the, the region between the two seas, the regions between the two tributaries, the Dordogne and the Gironde uh, tributaries. Um, this is primarily a white wine growing area, Sauvignon Blanc, Simignon. You do get some red wines, but this red wine is um, um, not nearly as structured uh, as what you see on, on the, uh, the Medoc side or the Old Medoc. So as a rule of thumb, what ends up happening is 
as you go from the very beginning of the Garonne River where it meets the Atlantic Ocean, as you move um, both inland and south, um, the wines become a, a little bit more, um, I want to, I'll use the term finessed. That doesn't mean that the wines can't be very big bodied, very structured wines. The, the region itself was, was created out of a glacial melt that happened millennia ago. And what ended up happening is as it carved out the river, the Garonne River, it left behind a trail of both uh, sedimentary rock and all kinds of formation. So as that glacier kind of went across the region, it started to melt, it ground up everything beneath it. And eventually, it, as it moved inland, it ground up things less and less. And so you end up having finer, uh, less uh, chunky material, less chunky soil. And therefore, you tend to have a little bit more of a finer, sandier uh, type of wine. And then by the time we get to the right Medoc, or to, excuse me, to the right bank, we end up having a high propensity for a lot more clay-based soils. Um, and so the, the shift is, is very apparent between left and right bank, the left bank being very gravelly and the right bank being very clay-based, which is kind of the, the, the reason why Merlot thrives in clay-based soils. Clay-based soils produce a little bit fresher style wines. They produce softer style wines. And in terms of soil, they tend to, uh, while they... Uh, 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 absorb more water, clay is not a type of soil that likes to give its water back. So it creates an environment that, that Merlot likes. Conversely, Cabernet likes very well-drained soils, gravelly soils being that very well-drained soils. And it's quite amazing, you know, over history that the Dutch were able to come in in the 1600s and basically drain the swamp and create a growing area that has become world-class. And, and so we talk about places that uh, grapes that need a lot of stress to to um, to become high quality wines. Well, this is uh, in Bordeaux. When we talk about particularly in the left bank, these are soils that are very rich, very alluvial, that have a lot of nutrition in them, uh, uh, nutrients in them that allow grapes to thrive. So the question is, is how do we get stress into the vine? And one of the biggest ways that we see stress be applied to a vineyard in France is by how much is planted per, he per acre or really per hectare. And again, uh, one acre is 2.47 hectares. So we, we plant a lot of vines uh, within a single acre to create competition, to naturally reduce yields, and we also drop a lot of fruit. So at the very highest level of production in both the left bank and the right bank, you're talking about less than two tons per acre uh, or four tons or really five tons per hectare um, of fruit. So you get a lot of concentration in a small place to create focus for your varietal, and that kind of mimics this idea of stressing fruit. Um, in addition, we also have a very long growing season. Again, the two, the two big primary issues within the growing season of Bordeaux uh, are rain, hail, and I guess the third issue would be uh, disease pressure from humidity. Um, the last comment to really make, and I'll talk about a story here in a moment, is as you move from the Atlantic, from the, from the left bank to the right bank, you shift in climate. So the left bank being a, uh, a maritime climate, as you go from the left bank to the right bank, you tend to become more continental in climate, meaning true, a true four seasons. And so obviously the styles of wine shift as a result of that. Uh, you tend to get a little bit more of an acid-focused driven wine on the right bank and then you do on the left bank. The left bank is really all about the purity and the concentration of the fruit combined with the production technique, which is typically always new French oak at the highest level, um, and then conversely with the right bank where it's Merlot and Cab Franc. Okay, drink. Don't forget to drink. Let's see, any other? Daniel. <clears throat> okay, so before we kind of move on to Rioja and, and, and provide the context for uh, the relationship between Bordeaux and Rioja, let's talk about some of this history that's super compelling that lends itself. We can't hear you. We can't hear you. He can't. Can you guys hear me? We 
you can. Okay. Look at the look at that vermin. <laughs> it's just waiting for you, Don. Come and get some. Uh, okay. Uh, so we're talking about kind of the 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 history that led up to um, why Bordeaux sets precedent for so much of what we see in in Rioja. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to make the assumption that we've all heard of phylloxera, uh, that, that aphid that basically destroys 98%, 99% of all the vineyards in Western Europe. And the result, the result is uh, basically this use of grafting from Native American rootstock onto European vines to basically produce a, um, a, a symbiotic relationship within the vine root relationship or excuse me, the, the, the vine root relationship to make sure that that vine stays alive and is not destroyed by phylloxera. I think we've all heard that story. One of the things that I think we, we really don't know uh, or we, have, we may have not heard is that prior to phylloxera, we have the, you know, we talk about the, the, the three horsemen, you know, phylloxera being one of them, but the other two horsemen are powdery mildew and, and downy mildew, which are, are all pandemics that the U.S. gave to the rest of the world because we're awesome and we do things like that. So the issue is, you know, Bordeaux was the, really the first European region to be exposed to downy mildew and powdery mildew. Uh, all, and again, all this is prior to 1863 when phylloxera was, was first um, at least observed in Bordeaux. Um, and the question is, is what did we, what, what, what was what, how was that handled? And the reality is, is that uh, through, the, through the use of chemistry and our understanding of chemistry at that time, we were able to create several concoctions that dealt with both powdery mildew and downy mildew, of which are widely used today um, in Texas vineyards and every vineyard around the world, particularly in organic vineyards. And um, organic farming is a conversation that is important to have. The question is, is how do you deal with the issues in a particular growing region that make the process of application sustainable? Um, and that's a conversation we can have another time, but understand that every time you have to make an application in your vineyard, it requires people, it requires a vehicle, um, or if it's done by hand, that means economics. So <clears throat> when we talk about um, organic farming, it's very difficult to farm a vineyard organically in a region that has a lot of disease pressure, meaning a region that has humidity in its growing environment or a region that has rain in its growing season, like Texas, like Bordeaux, like a lot of other places around the world. It's not impossible. It just takes a lot of resources and a lot of money to make it happen. So there's, there's two things that came out of a result of Bordeaux that are used around the world today. And one is called the Bordeaux mixture. And the other one is sulfur. And we talk about sulfur, SO2, and sulfites as a, as a negative. But in reality, sulfur is, is one of these, these beautiful things that, ha that we have at our disposal to use that allow us to protect the plant and the vine and the fruit and the ultimate juice in a way that um, other things can't because it's so evasive. Sulfur, while we think it, it, it affects us in a negative way, in reality is a very light and delicate type of uh, um, additive to a wine or a spray that we can spray in the vineyard for uh, mold and mildew and things like that. But more, more importantly, when we talk about the Bordeaux mixture, the Bordeaux mixture is a combination of copper, copper sulfite, and um, calcium carbonate, which is a, a, a way for us to create a liquid that is a lot easier to spread um, that goes into the vineyard and is also considered organic. The problem with copper, however, is that it's elemental, and meaning it doesn't degrade down to anything else. So once you spray it in your vineyard, your vineyard has to figure out how to deal with that. And so what you end up seeing is that um, most, mostly what is sprayed is sulfur. So typically in a, in a new world growing area, um, I include obviously Texas in that, Typically in the, in, the, in the growing season, particularly in the early spring and mid to late spring, um, we see a, a spray regimen of about basically every 10 days they're in the vineyard spraying to make sure that that plant is protected from all kinds of humidity, 
uh, and mold and mildew that may come along the way. And then in the event that there is a major rain, they will, they will spray a, a copper sulfate mixture, which is even more protective. And so these are all, while, you know, we talk about pandemics and uh, this may be a trivia question. So Don, I hope you're paying attention. <laughs> um, pandemics of the world, black rot, downy mildew, phylloxera are all really the first three pandemics to hit the world that were gifts from the United States. And how Bordeaux dealt with them is how we kind of have learned and have taught other regions all around the world and what to do and how to deal with that. Um, the other, the other thing to talk about as a, as an outfalling of these pandemics is at some point you get tired of dealing with issues and you decide to close shop and go someplace else. Uh, and this, this ultimately happens in Bordeaux um, and, and really in all of France, but particularly Bordeaux. And, and so what ends up happening during the time of phylloxera, you have these producers that either don't have the means, don't have the knowledge, don't have the resources to deal with phylloxera in addition to all these other uh, issues like downy mildew and powdery mildew. Um, and they decide to basically close shop and go someplace else. Well, uh, if you remember, Nacho's snoring. I don't know if he can hear it, but he's dreaming a bit. But um, so what they end up doing is they, 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 a lot of them move. They, they go to other parts of France. They go to Italy. They go to Spain. And what ends up happening is the culture of winemaking for those producers that traveled from France to Spain. Oh, I love that sound. It, it just sounds so good. Uh, those producers that traveled from France to Spain, uh, a lot of them ended up in Rioja, and they brought that technique with them. And that's where we're going to segue into Rioja.